Hey, so welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Coping's weekly webinar of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, 20 minutes every Wednesday at noon. So today I'm joined by Casa Vetara. She is a member of the International Relations Commission of the Loudness Workers Movement, or MSC, in Brazil. And we are here today to talk about the eviction of 450 families from Quilombo Campo Grande in Brazil. So just to give you a very short introduction, on August 12th, in the middle of a pandemic, a businessman who happens to be the governor of uh, Minas Gerais, his name is uh, Romeo Zema, he sent the military police uh, to evict this uh, 450 families from the 22-year-old camp known for its production of organic coffee. Uh, they surrounded the families, uh, they intimidated them, and they tried to force them to leave. But the families resisted uh, for a period of time. Until finally on August 14, the Minas Gerais uh, uh, military police successfully uh, evicted one of the areas of Quilombo Campo Grande, destroying, demolishing the, ha the homes of 14 peasant families, crops, and even a popular school named after Eduardo Galeano. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Gracia, for being here with us. And yeah, before we start with this conversation, I want you to explain, uh, I mean, you are a member of the MSC. Uh, what is the MSC? Can you explain to us um, what is the MSC? <laughs> Hi, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so the Landless Workers Movement, uh, MST, as a Brazilian name, uh, is a peasant movement that have been working and organizing uh, peasant families for 36 years, uh, and mainly with three objectives. One is the struggle for land. So uh, I don't know if the U.S. audience knows, but Brazil has one of the most unequal land distributions in the world. So it means that 40% of the land, the, the agricultural land in Brazil, is owned by 1% of the population. Uh, so what we do is to uh, occupy unproductive land uh, to make pressure over the government to give those lands for agrarian reform. Uh, the second main goal is the struggle for agrarian reform itself, which, which is broader than the democratization of land. Right, it means uh, we don't want to have uh, lands to do the same thing as the uh, big landowners do, right? So we want to build different model of production uh, based on agriculture, uh, agroecology, based on uh, food sovereignty. And the third goal is uh, the radical transformation of society. We understand that uh, people's agrarian reform, and we, as we call our project of agrarian reform is only possible in a different society. So we need to struggle with the whole broader society in Brazil for uh, structural change in our society. So this is what MSC has been doing for 36 years. Thank you, Cassia. Thank you so much for uh, explaining to us um, what is the MSC. It's very inspiring. And yeah, to begin with our subject today, I just um, wanted to, uh, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about the historic background of these families. So as I said at the beginning, on August 12th, the governor, Romeo Zema, from Minas Gerais, he sent the military police to evict 450 families. But who are these families? Uh, what are they doing there? How did they got there in the in the first place and um what do they do there like i understand that they are uh the largest coffee or organic coffee producers of brazil so yeah can you talk to us uh about these families please okay uh so first we need to understand a little bit the history of that area right so that area used to be a former uh sugar cane plant that went bankrupt in the late 90s, right? So when it went bankrupt, it left millions of reais in debt with the state and with the, the workers. 
the, the former owner didn't pay uh, labor rights to the workers, right? So uh, when we occupied the, those lands, it was 22 years ago. It was occupied mainly by the former workers who had not been paid and together with some families from the surrounding areas, right? So those families have been living there for 22 years. They have built their lives there. They have their house, they have their crops, they have their school. Uh, they are one of the biggest uh, organic coffee producers in the region. Uh, as well as coffee, they produce cattle, uh, chicken, vegetables, like many other things. They have a cooperative uh, for the production of the organic coffee. So for 22 years, they have been raising their kids and living their lives there. But this is one of the oldest land conflicts in Brazil, because during these 22 years, there has been a judicial battle between this uh, new uh, owner of the land and the landless, right? Because there is an expropriation official order from uh, 2014, uh, decreeing that the area should be expropriated for a grand reform. But this new owner... Who is, who is this new owner? I mean, who is requesting this expulsion? And, and talk to us about that. It's, it's a businessman, right, behind all this. And also, what are the interests of the governor of the area and Bolsonaro and all this? Yeah. The, 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 the new owner, as, we, as he says, he calls himself, is called Giovanni Souza Moreira. He is a businessman, but he is also a politician okay. from the same party as the governor Zema and a political ally of Bolsonaro. Okay. So this is the political aspect behind it. Also, this guy, this uh, Giovanni, he is in a partnership with another businessman, very powerful, called uh, João Faria, who is the biggest coffee producer in Brazil, who produces the coffee for Nestlé, for example. So there is a lot of economic and political uh, issues behind this land conflict. And yeah. So that's why we understand that uh, on the eviction order of uh, August 12, even though there is uh, an issue that should, there shouldn't be an eviction during the pandemic, because in this regard of anything else, I mean, we know that the families have the right to the land and all of this, but we have a pandemic and just putting all those families in streets is just inhuman. In, in, in those times, right, where uh, most of the governors of Brazil have decided not to uh, authorize any kind of eviction, rural or urban, because of, of, of a hum humanitarian issue, right, putting all those families in the, in the streets in the middle of the pandemic. But even though Governor Zema closed any channel of nego negotiations with, with MST, I mean, it was, and it was something really, uh, strange if you didn't know the political aspect because be, behind it because uh, he received a lot of pressure parliamentarian pressure uh, national and, and international solidarity asking him to please stop the eviction at least until the end of the pandemic and he just like closed any kind any channel of, of negotiation and sent 250 poly police officers to the, to the area. And uh, even worse, uh, police officers from different cities that came to a very small city, carrying the virus to a very small city, which is Campo do Meio, and carrying back to their families as well. So it's not only the landless families, but also the police officers' families were exposed to the virus with this uh, eviction order. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so um, so the military police arrived to, to Campo Grande and I mean, they intimidating these families, they destroyed uh, property, even the, the school, the Eduardo Galeano school where teenagers and adults and children studied, right? And like, is this legal? And if it's not, has the MSD or the those families have used like a, a legal resource have you know like take taken this to the legal grounds what have you done in the legal aspect you see the eviction order was for a very small part of the camp the whole camp uh, has four thousand hectares of land right the eviction order was for only 52 hectares of the land Right, those are the area we where legally the police could evict the families, right? But we need to remember also, Michelle, that uh, before the police could advance, uh, the families took a very brave resistance. It was 56 hours of resistance from the families, trying to stop making barriers, trying to, to stop the, the, the police from advancing, and only after 56. 56 hours when the police started burning the crops and sending the bombs uh, over the families or where uh, were, were when they could advance to that uh, 52 hectares of land. What was illegal about that is that well in that 52 hectares of land was located the school, Eduardo Galeano's school, was located the collective uh, shacks of production uh, for production of the coffee and seven houses. So they destroyed all those uh, facilities, but they advanced towards uh, more than the legal area that they could evict. In fact, until today, the police is there. So after they evicted the, the 52 hectares, that was in the official order of the, the judicial order of the eviction. They expanded the eviction towards a territory where they were not allowed at all to, to evict the families. So they are until now destroying crops, burning the, the if you see the, the pictures, I was talking to the, com to the comrades in the area now, if you see the pictures where before were like beautiful coffee crops, now it's like all burnt. There is nothing anymore. And uh, so what we understand is that first, um, the, illegality, the, the illegalities committed by the police or the way they advanced towards the families with a lot of violence, uh, the, 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 uh, the fact that they, they went over the area where the, the judicial order authorized them to do the action and apart from from the ju uh, judicial illegalities we understand that there is a inhumanity behind it all to do such a thing with families that do who live there for 22 years who raise their kids there who destroying a school where the kids studied where adults learned how to read and write adults who had no opportunities to do that uh, before that school was built to burn crops that were producing food to be donated this camp was producing food for donation in the areas where people were not being able to get food because of the pandemic so there is a inhumanity behind it all that it's bigger than any judicial order could, could uh, allow it's heartbreaking it is. So what is the legal process that you are doing? So right now we are uh, getting, a, uh, we are in a judicial battle for this area that uh, is, is uh, bigger than the area that the judicial order of eviction uh, allowed the policemen. So they are entering an area that is not in that court order, but there is, the, there is still another legal process for the whole area that the, the owner is asking for 
the eviction of the whole 4,000 acres. This is still being uh, in the process of, uh, of the tribunal. So this is the, the, the main judicial battle that we need to, to, to take now. We cannot allow that a judicial order of eviction for the whole camp, for the whole 4,000 hectares of land where the rest of the families live. So far, only 14 families were evicted. They are now living in the house of the other 430 families. I was going to ask, that was my next question, like what happened with these families? What are they doing right now? And like, if, if any, has the government or the, the has done something to help them during the pandemic? How are they being arranged right now? No, the other families took them into their houses and they are now organizing collective uh, uh, work to build new house for them in the, in the territory of the other families. Since they have a collective area, so they are collectively building the new, and they are now uh, starting, uh, probably on next Monday, to rebuild the school. So what the family said, brick by brick, whatever they destroyed, you will rebuild. And this is something very beautiful. That you can see that those families, they are not going to give up that land. It's 22 years. It's not some, it's not two years or, or two months, right? So And what is uh what are like what is the position of other organizations in the country? What is the position of uh of Lula's uh, workers party uh about all this whole conflict? Tell us a little bit about the situation in the country, in the public opinion. Yeah, we have to say that uh we received a very, very big solidarity from individuals, organizations, political parties, uh, people like calling the governor, you know, calling the police to stop the eviction. Uh, even uh, the media at some point uh, was against the eviction. I think uh, the situation that we are living in the country I mean, you know that in the U.S. as well. Uh, U.S. and Brazil, we are the epicenter of the pandemic. We are seeing so many people dying every day, you know, and I think that makes people more sensitive to see, okay, instead of taking care of the people who are dying, this government is just like evicting people from their house to make even more people die. So I think this also brought a lot of solidarity. Uh, yeah. in, also from individuals in Brazil and internationally. We received a lot of videos, uh, messages, people writing to the governor. Uh, so there was a, a very intense uh, solidarity chain around uh, Quilombo Campo Grande. And we understand that this is something that um, almost as if, if part of the Brazilian society is kind of awakening for uh, this kind of injustice during the pandemic. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Like we will think that in a moment like this, uh, you know, there were, I don't know, the money that is used for police or military police will be used to feed the people or to try to, you know, help in this struggle that we are all going through. And it's the country, I mean, what 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 they're doing, evicting th these families and leaving them with nothing, and destroying the things that they built with, you know, such work and, and time, years, it's just heartbreaking. It doesn't make sense. So please tell us how can we help in the, you know, the international solidarity? What's the best strategy? What is the most uh, successful way that we can uh, do something to help? See, uh, during those 56 hours of resistance, uh, we are sure that one of the things that like helped the families to stand for such a long time was the international and national solidarity. Like uh, on the on August 12th, uh, we were like in the world trends of Twitter uh, against Zema, yeah. calling uh, Zema to stop the eviction. So all this has helped a lot, uh, not in the negotiation with the government because the government didn't want to hear about it, but 
it gave a lot of strength to the families and it made also the Brazilian society to uh, get to know what was happening. So now uh, we are going, our strategy is still to make pressure on the social medias and we are going to keep Code Pink uh, informed of all the next steps. Uh, but also probably we are going to open another um, campaign to write to the military police and to the agrarian court, uh, response, uh, making them responsible to what's happening to those families and also to what's happening to the population of that region that was very exposed to the dis dissemination of the virus because of that eviction of order. Oh, thank you so much for all this. And of course, you can count on us. Uh, all our listeners and our viewers are going to uh, be with you and support you in any way. I know this. And uh, also Code Pink, of course. And I really, I want to thank you for all the time that you've uh, given us today and explaining the situation. And I hope we will maybe do another webinar sometime so we can, I don't know, share the good news that, uh, that you want, that we want, the people want. Okay. So thank you very much. And we see the, the hub of the families of Quilombo from Campo Grande for your solidarity and for keeping struggling with them. Thank you.